said, I, I, we can work that out. And so uh, I said, is there anything in particular you'd like me to speak on? And so he emailed me back and he said, well, what do you think of the prophecies uh, in Daniel chapter 12? And time prophecy in general in the books of Daniel and Revelation. He said, do you believe that they are a day for a day? Or do you believe that they are prophetic time a day for a year? Well, I emailed him back and told him what I thought. And he said, oh, would you please speak on that when you come here to Korea? Which I said I would. Well, when I got to Korea, um, there was another gentleman who was speaking each morning uh, right after I would. I would speak at about 10. He would come on right about 11 o'clock. And uh, the third day that I was there, I spoke on this particular topic. Well, right after I spoke on it, this gentleman then got up and uh, he said that I was being abusive of him, that I was personally attacking him, and that, uh, that it was very ungracious of me to be doing that. Now, he happened to be a Korean-American, so he could speak fluent Korean and fluent uh, English. Um, well, through the course of the meetings, there was a little bit of warmth that was exchanged, not between myself and the other man. Um, I rarely spoke with him. Uh, but uh, anyway, I find this subject, friends, to be very, very volatile very volatile amongst us as a people. How do we interpret time prophecy in Daniel and Revelation? It's very, very important that we understand it correctly. Shortly thereafter, um, I got back from Korea. That was at the end of July. And about three, two to three weeks ago, I was down in Loma Linda, California. After speaking there on Friday evening and then all through Sabbath, I went down to San Diego and had three meetings down there on Sunday morning. Um, in a con it was a Seventh-day Adventist Conference Church. Well, during the course of the meetings down in San Diego, uh, there was an individual there that believed a certain way about time prophecy. And so I pulled out this talk and shared it with the individual so that they could rightly understand time in those books. So with that in mind, we're going to take a look at this subject, Daniel, Revelation, and time. You know, one thing that I love about the writings of Ellen White is there's no possibility of confusion about what she's saying. Amen. Very, very clear. Very clear. When she talked, she spoke in plain English. And I love that about the spirit of prophecy. Let's listen to what she had to say about time. This is taken from Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 73. Listen to what she said. I plainly stated at the Jackson Camp meeting to these fanatical parties that they were doing the work of the adversary of souls, they were in darkness. They claimed to have great light that probation would close in October of 1840, or 1884. Now before I continue, we need to keep in mind that there were many Adventist people after the great disappointment in 1844 that continued to say that Jesus was going to come very soon and they would set dates. And this group at the Jackson Camp Meeting were doing just that. In fact, the famous man, the famous Adventist pioneer, who predicted the fall of the Ottoman Empire, when did he say they would fall? Does anybody remember that? 1840. Who said that? Very good, Jamie, that's right. He said that in August of 1840, the Ottoman Empire would, would fall. And he based that on Revelation chapter 9. Well, that, what was the man's name? Josiah Litch. 
Josiah Litch, that's right, ma'am. What is your name? Kathleen. Kathleen, that's exactly right, Kathleen. Josiah Litch predicted that based on the year day principle. Now, with the, with the great disappointment in 1844, many Seventh day Adventists, and Josiah Litch was one of them, they started predicting that Jesus would come in the early 1850s or into the 1860s. They were constantly predicting Christ coming in the future and setting dates. Well, the people here in Jackson were doing the same thing. And notice the, the very direct words that Ellen White used to relate to these people. She said they were a fanatical party. They were doing the work of the adversary of souls. They were in darkness. Now those are very strong, direct words. Going on, in the context, she says, I there stated in public that the Lord had been pleased to show me that there would be no definite time in the message given of God since when? 1844. There would be no definite message based on time since 1844. And I knew that this message, which four or five were engaged in advocating with great zeal, was heresy. So here she goes again. She puts a line in the sand and she says, if you're setting prophetic, if you're setting dates into the future on time, she said that's heresy. If you're doing that, it's fanatical. You're working for the adversary of souls. You're walking in darkness. And that's what Ellen White said. She goes on. The visions of this poor child were not of God. This light came not from heaven. Time was short, but the end was not yet. A great work was to be accomplished to prepare people to be sealed with the seal of the living God. Now here's another statement. This is letter 38, 1888. This one's as clear as the last one. There were many proclaiming a new time after 1844. But I was shown that we should not have another definite time to proclaim to the people. Off-repeated message of definite time was exactly what the enemy wanted, and it served his purpose well to unsettle the faith in the first proclamation of time, which was of heavenly origin. Our position has been one of waiting and watching with no time proclamation to intervene between the close of prophetic periods in 1844 and the time of the Lord's coming. Now, could it be any clearer than that? According to the Spirit of God, there would be no definite time period from 1844 down to the close to the Lord's coming. So if somebody comes along today, based on what this says, if we're going to believe the Spirit of Prophecy, we're going to believe that Ellen White had a prophetic gift. Amen. Then we must agree with the fact that there will be no more time prophecy between 1844 and Christ's second coming. Yeah. So if somebody comes along today and says, oh, you know, at, at a certain date, like say at the National Sunday Law, it, from that day, from that time, it's going to be a period of X number of years. It's going to be three and a half years. Or it's going to be 1,290 1, days. Or, uh, you know, 390 days. Or it's going to be uh, 1,335 days. Both. If we're going to believe the spirit of prophecy, then we're going to reject that message. And we're going to reject it because Ellen White rejected it. Mm -hmm. And we're going to admit and say that doctrine, that teaching is heresy. 
It's heresy. It's not from God. Now, folks, do you remember the guy recently? What was his name? Um, back in May, he said that Jesus was going to come at a certain date. What was his name? What was his name? Harold Camping. Camping. That's right, Kathleen. Harold Camping. Do you remember everybody that was following Harold Camping? They were so excited. Oh, a great event's going to happen. I think he said Jesus was coming, didn't he, Kathleen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, they were going to be raptures. Wasn't that it? Yeah, rapture. Okay, there was going to be a rapture of the believers. And so Harold Camping is preaching this message, and, and his followers, they're selling everything they have, and they're just so excited. And Harold Camping, he's not selling anything or most anything he had, but everybody else that's believing what he's saying was. Now, when it didn't come to pass, what happened? He said another day. He said another day. How did the people feel after the first date that he said? They were discouraged. They were depressed. Why? Because when Harold Camping kept saying, the Lord is telling me that we're going to be raptured on such and such a date. Folk, everybody believed, or the people that followed him thought he was telling the truth. And when it didn't happen, there was depression and discouragement and frustration. And it made people distrust the message of God that they felt was coming through that man. Folk, the thing that happens when we start trusting and saying, oh, but it's in this time in the future, this is going to happen. When it doesn't happen, folks, people get so discouraged because they say, well, God's message can't be trusted. It's not that God's message can't be trusted. It's that people that surmise on something they think a verse or they think a statement is saying is a wrong summation. So it's very, very important that we keep these in mind. There will not be another definite time to proclaim to the people. From 1844 to Christ's second coming, there are no more prophetic times. There's no three and a half year periods. There's none in the future. There's none. And if you hear somebody say there are, friend, you're hearing the adversary of souls trying to lead you into darkness. That's the plain and simple facts. Plain and simple. Now, Revelation chapter 10 talks about the great disappointment in 1844. It talks about how Christ uh, stood with one foot on the land, one foot on the sea. He had a, a little book in his hand that was open. What was that little book in Christ's hand? It was the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel was open, and it tasted, how did it taste in the mouth? It was sweet. Because the, the thought that Christ was coming in 1844, that was sweet. But then when it got into the stomach, it was bitter. It was bitter. It was a bitter disappointment. Well, in that context, in Revelation chapter 10, where it talks about that experience of the Advent people, it says here, right down here at the bottom, I believe this is verse 6 or 7, it says, the earth and the things that are therein, the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. After 1844, no more time. No more time. <coughs> time in the books of Daniel and Revelation play a very significant role. They pinpoint the most important events in human history. Time prophecy tells us the exact time of the sinister power of Antichrist in history. This period is referred to seven times in the Bible. Time prophecy pinpoints the exact time of Christ's baptism, his death, and the close of probation on the ancient church of God, the Israelites. 
It also nails down the time when judgment would begin in the heavenly sanctuary. These are understood when applying time as a day equals a year. The time periods make no sense when applied as a day for a day. Now let's think about that for a minute. What are the time periods that pinpoint the rise and fall of the papacy? How are they referred to in Daniel and Revelation? Come on. Come on. What's the question again? So what you guys are telling me is, is that your lunch is settling. Is that <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm here. I'm asking the question. Well, that, that was good, Vaughn, that you picked it up the second time and asked me to repeat it. However, well, the first time I repeated it. <laughs> well, maybe I'm having a little bit of effect from that lunch. <laughs> What are the different ways that the rise and fall of the Antichrist is referred to in time in Daniel and Revelation? Time times and half a time. Time times and half a time. Bill, what's another way? 42, times. 42 months. What's another way? The dividing of time. Okay, he said that one. Time times and dividing of time. 42 months. And what's the third one? 1260 days. Okay, those are the three different ways that the same 1260 year time period is referred to in Daniel and Revelation. Now, how about the time of Christ's baptism, death, and the probation on the Jews? Where is that found? No, Daniel 7 is not right. At least I know you guys are awake. How about the rest of you? Isabel, at least you laughed. I, I know you're awake. Come on. Where's that down? Daniel 9, huh? Daniel chapter 9, Bill. That's exactly right. Daniel 9, 24 to 27. That's right. Daniel 9, 24 to 27. And then judgment would begin in the sanctuary. When did that take place? 8.44. Daniel 8. Daniel 8.14 connected to Daniel 9, 18.44. Okay. The first time reference. Well, let's take a look. This isn't the first time reference. Go in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1. Let's do a little lesson here. Daniel chapter 1. Verse 14 it says, So he consented, this is talking about Melzar, he consented to them in this matter and proved them for ten days. So Daniel and his friends were going to eat a vegetarian diet for ten days. Now, was that ten literal days or was that ten prophetic days? Equaling ten years. How much was it? It was literal days. Literal days. But we got to be practical and logical when we look at the Bible. One of the arguments that the gentleman gave in Korea for why Daniel's time periods in his book could be either a day for a day or a day equals a year is because of Daniel chapter 1. He said, well, if, it, if it's all a day for a year, then in Daniel chapter 1, Daniel and his friends were proved for 10 years. I mean, that's, that's just being silly. And it's being foolish. Yeah. So let's be a little bit rational, a little bit logical here. That's the first time period mentioned in the book of Daniel. The second one is found in Daniel chapter 4. And it has to do with the story of Nebuchadnezzar. 
The Bible says in Daniel chapter 4, verse 16 and verse 23. It says, let his heart be changed from man's. Let a beast's heart be given to him. Let seven times pass over him. Whereas the king saw a watcher and a holy one coming down from heaven and said, Hew the tree down and destroy it. Yet leave the stump of the roots therein and the earth even with a band of iron and brass. In the tender grass of the field let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. So Nebuchadnezzar was to be driven from his throne, went into a field and became as an animal for seven times. Now, is that literal time or is that prophetic time? Is that a day for a day or is that a day for a year? What is it? How long did Nebuchadnezzar go crazy? Was it for seven years or was it for 360 times seven? How long was it? It was for seven years. So again, in Daniel chapter 4, it's literal time. It's literal time. Nebuchadnezzar went crazy for seven years. Prophets and Kings, page 520. For seven years, Nebuchadnezzar was an astonishment to all his subjects. For seven years, he was humbled before all the world. Then his reason was restored, and looking up in humility to the God of heaven, he recognized the divine hand in his chastisement. So in Daniel chapter 4, the times, those are literal years, seven years, Nebuchadnezzar went crazy. The next reference to time in Daniel is Daniel 7.25. The Bible says he shall speak great words against the Most High, whereof the saints of the Most High think to change times and laws. They shall be given to his hand for a time and times and the dividing of time. Now, was that literal time? 1,260 1, literal days? Or was that prophetic time 1,260 years? It's prophetic time. Prophetic time. The papacy began ruling. They're the little horn of Daniel 7. They start in 538 AD. If we say it's literal time, that means somewhere in the summer of 541, the papacy fell. Is that logical? Of course not. The papacy ruled for 1260 years. So we have here prophetic time. The little horn speaks blasphemous words against God. The Bible says that blasphemy is claiming to be God, claiming the power to forgive sins. The little horn persecutes the people of God. The little horn seeks to change the Ten Commandments. The little horn rules the world for three and a half times, or 1,260 days. And of course, the Bible declares that a day in Bible prophecy is a year. Numbers 14.34, Ezekiel 4.6. So the papacy ruled for 1260 years. 1260 years. Great controversy, page 54. It says in the 6th century the papacy had become firmly established. Seat of power was fixed in the imperial city. And going down, the dragon had given to the beast his power to seat in great authority. Revelation 13.2. Now began the 1260 years of papal oppression foretold in the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation. Daniel 7.25, Revelation 13.5-7. That's in Great Controversy, page 54. Okay, here's another statement from Great Controversy 439. For 42 months, the time times and the dividing of time, the three and a half years or 1260 days, the time during which the papal power was to oppress God's people. This period, as stated in preceding chapters, began with the supremacy of the papacy. 538 terminated in 1798. At that time, the Pope was made captive by the French army. The papal power received its deadly wound 
and the prediction was fulfilled. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. So the papacy lost their control over the governments of Europe. They lost their political power in 1798, ending the 1260 year period. Never in the writings of Ellen White does she apply the time, times, and half a time, or the 42 months, or the 1260 days in a literal way. She never applies them as literal time. But what happens if some preacher or scholar or theologian comes along and applies them that way? What happens if they say, well, you know, the, the three and a half years or the 1260 days, maybe it applied in the dark ages, but in the future now, it applies as literal time. Well, see, the Bible gives no justification for that. No justification whatsoever. So what do we do if we hear somebody saying that? If we read it in a book, what do we do? Do we keep reading and say, oh, this looks good? Or, oh, that person, maybe he has new light. No, folks, that's not new light. That's old darkness. That's garbage. And if you're reading that in a book, that book belongs in a circular file. That's not a book worthy of reading, folk, because it's a book like that or it's a, a speaker like that that's going to lead you down a path toward the hosts of darkness, towards heresy. You don't want to go there. You don't want to go there. Ellen White's made it so plain and so simple. She always explained the 1260 days as 1260 years. She always applied them from 538 to 1798. And then if somebody says, oh, but she didn't know better. Well, <laughs> now it becomes an issue over the inspiration of Ellen White. Was she a messenger that God sent? to explain the Bible, or was she not? See, and if we say, well, she wasn't, well, if we say that, friend, then, then we've got to say either she was of God or she was of the devil. As she herself said, you can't play a middle ground with what she wrote. It's either yes or no. And if we say no, then we have then ascribed the work of the Spirit of God to the devil. And what did Jesus call that? Unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin. That's right. The unpardonable sin. It's very dangerous. Very dangerous ground. And ground I personally don't want to walk on. Don't want to walk there. It would do well for God's professed people today to apply them the same way she did. To apply them as literal is to bring confusion to time in the books of Daniel and Revelation. Daniel 8.14 is the next reference to time in the book of Daniel. Said unto me unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. This passage refers to the time period from 457 B.C. to 1844 A.D. This passage pinpoints the beginning of the judgment in the heavenly sanctuary in 1844. Now somebody say, boy, Bill, you're taking a lot of jumps there. Well, we're not looking at Daniel chapter 8 today as the focus of our study. But if anybody is interested and you're not real clear on Daniel 7, 8, and 9 or Daniel 7, 8, 9, 11, and 12, I've got those all on PowerPoint. I could send them to you over email if you're interested. You could go through them in your own leisure time. Okay? So if anybody would be interested in PowerPoint programs on how we get from Daniel 8.14 to 1844, be happy to send that to you. Be happy to do that. 
Never in the spirit of prophecy is this passage ever applied as a day for a day. It's always applied as 2,300 years. When I first became a Seventh-day Adventist back in the late 1970s, I worked at the Pacific Press when it was still in Mountain View, California. And my supervisor in periodical mailing, his name was, um, his name was Pat McCoy, uh, a fine gentleman, a fine gentleman, in fact, I remember as I was getting ready to go up to Pacific Union College, he took me into his office, and this was the kind of man he was. He, he sat me down, he said, now Bill, you're going to PUC, and you're going to take study theology. He said, beware, beware, there's a controversy at PUC. I said, over what? I didn't know, I'd just become a Seventh-day Adventist. He said, there's two Australians there. And they're both preaching opposite things. And they both appear to be preaching heresy. I said, well, what are their names? He said, one is Desmond Ford and the other is Irwin Gain. He said, don't take any classes from them. Well, friends, I said, thanks, Pat. I appreciate that. And I'll, I'll be very careful. When I got to PUC the first quarter, I didn't take a class from either of those Australian gentlemen. I did attend a Sabbath school class of both of them, and I prayed earnestly before I went in that God would show me and help me to see right from the Bible and Ellen White if they were right or if they were wrong. Well, he showed me very clearly by the lessons that were given that day as I compared the Bible with the spirit of prophecy that Desmond Ford was definitely teaching outside of inspiration. But Irwin Gain was teaching well within inspiration. The next quarter I took classes from Irwin Gain, and they were a great blessing to me. Amen. Well, my point of the story is this. After I had been at PUC for two years, I went home to visit my family, and uh, I went by to see Pat McCoy. And Pat was an artist par excellence. And he invited me to his home one evening, and I was in there in his study with him. He said, Bill, I have got new light. I said, oh, really, Pat? He said, oh, yeah, this is beautiful. He said, let me show you. Well, folks, he had made these beautiful charts, so colorful, color-coordinated, all these dates and times and events and Oh, they were beautiful. But you know what he did? He took the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation, and he said they applied prophetically in the past, but now in the future, they are literal time. And folk, it did not ring true. It did not ring true. I'd only been an Adventist for two years. I didn't know. But the Spirit of God was saying, no, that's not right. Time prophecy in Daniel and Revelation is a day for a year, not a day for a day. You know what? I never saw Pat again. Never saw Pat again. Why not? What did we have in common? What did we have in common? He was seeing the Bible one way, Folk, Daniel and Revelation are so key to understanding the messages for today. Amen. And as a Seventh-day Adventist, if we can't agree on Daniel and Revelation and what they're talking about, where is their ground for harmony? There wasn't. There wasn't. Broke my heart. Broke my heart. Folk, when truth is at stake, it doesn't matter who's sharing it. If it's wrong, it's wrong. It's that simple. It's that simple. That was my first very, very bitter taste of somebody claiming to have great light who is applying time into the future. It was a very bitter pill to swallow. Great Controversy 399-400 says that which led to this movement was the discovery that the decree of Artaxerxes for the restoration of Jerusalem 
which formed the starting point for the period of the 2300 days, went into effect in the autumn of the year 457 BC, and not at the beginning of the year as had been formally believed. Reckoning from the autumn of 457, the 2300 years terminated in the autumn of 1844. She is referencing here the seven month movement. The seven month movement. But she pinpoints the 2300 days as 2300 years beginning in 457 and ending in 1844. Again, in Maranatha, page 247, it says the exact same thing. The only way to explain Daniel chapter 8 and the 2300 years is to explain it by Daniel chapter 9. Because Daniel 8.14 was not understood by Daniel through chapter 8. Had to go to chapter 9 for an explanation. So that's why you have to take Daniel 8.14 and Daniel 9, 25 to 27 to explain 18.44. Daniel 9, 24 to 27 talks about the 490 years, the 70 weeks that are cut off for God's people and for Jerusalem to finish the transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Somewhere in that 490 year period, somebody would come who would finish the transgression and make an end of sin, make reconciliation for iniquity. This pinpoints the work of the Messiah. And folk, if you will, it's this understanding of Daniel 9, 24 to 27 that utterly destroys the futuristic teaching of the Jesuit order. Because the Jesuits take the last three and a half years of this time period of the 490 and they kick it all the way down to the end of time and say that's going to be the rise of the Antichrist. But it's very, very clear that the last three and a half years of the 490 year prophecy go from 31 to 34 AD. Maranatha 247 confirms that. Ellen White, in talking about that, she says, Our faith in reference to the messages of the first, second, and third angels was correct. The great way marks we have passed are immovable. Immovable. So if a scholar comes along and reapplies Daniel 9, what are you going to say? Oh, I love it. I hope not. Our understanding of those time periods is immovable, folks. Don't go moving them. Don't go moving them. The great way marks we passed are immovable, although the hosts of hell may try to tear them from their foundation and triumph in the thought that they have succeeded, yet they do not succeed. Who tries to tear them from their foundation? Who tries to reapply them to the future? says there, the hosts of hell try to tear them from their foundation. These pillars of truth stand firm as the eternal hills, unmoved by all the efforts of men, combined with those of Satan and his hosts. We can learn much and should be constantly searching the scriptures to see if these things are so. Time periods in Daniel 7 through 9 only make sense when applied as a day equals a year. Applying them as a day equals a literal day makes the time periods as nonsense. The papacy didn't reign for three and a half literal years. Daniel 8, 14 makes no sense applied as a day equals a literal day. Daniel 9 is ridiculous when applied that way too. Never in Ellen White does she ever apply the time periods as such. She consistently applies time as a day equals a year. Shame on us for stepping outside the counsel of 
the Lord. Amen. Amen. You say, oh, but Bill, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's just like what we looked at this morning. It doesn't matter what Bible we read. It doesn't matter when we eat or how much we eat or how many times a day we eat. It doesn't matter what time I get to bed at night. Yes, it does matter. Everything we do matters. The Bible we read does matter. <clears throat> what kind of a car, when I go to a car lot, what kind of a car am I going to get? Am I going to get one that I know is faulty, that needs uh, the transmission overhaul, where the gaskets are leaking oil? Is that the kind of car I'm going to get? Or am I going to get the best car in the best condition possible? Which kind am I going to get? Does it matter? You bet it matters, Curtis. You bet it matters. And for us to take the position, well, it doesn't matter what I believe on time. I can believe it's a day for a day. It doesn't make any difference. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Just like the kind of car you're going to buy off the lot. It's got flat tires and leaky gaskets and a transmission that it doesn't help you change from first to second. That matters. That matters. Daniel chapter 12, the one that so many people twist and turn and distort. Daniel 12, verse 7, 11 and 12. The Bible says, I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, shall be for a time, times and a half, when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Now, before we go on to verses 11 and 12, there's a time period, a time, times, and half a time. When did we see that before? Where was it? Well, you know, I had some ear swabs. <laughs> I had some in my little bag you know that I brought with me and this morning before I came here I saw those ear swabs and I thought no I cleaned my ears on Thursday so I should be okay this morning <laughs> well maybe I'm not maybe my ears got real clogged up with wax over the last few days or maybe you guys just aren't speaking loud enough <laughs> Isabel, would you say that? See, again, I can't hear very well. Daniel 7? Daniel 7. Daniel chapter 7. What verse is it about? 25. Daniel 7, verse 25. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel 7, verse 25 refers to the same time period of a time, times, and half a time. Just as Daniel chapter 12 and verse 7. Same time period. Now, some people today say, well, you know, in Daniel 7, 25, that's prophetic time. But over here in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 7, that's literal time now. This is talking about literal time. This time starts when the National Sunday Law comes and it extends down to, oh, about the end of the place. See, now there's a very prominent Seventh-day Adventist by the name of Marion Berry who writes that very thing. There's another lady that Steve and I were just talking about up in Canada, wrote this big book on the book of Daniel where she takes this time and applies it to the future. The folk... If the time, times, and half a time of Daniel 7 was prophetic time, and we say now in Daniel 12 and verse 7 that now it's literal time, what does that tell you about God's character? What does that tell you about the God of heaven? What does that tell you? He's confused. Now, who is the author of confusion? Satan. Satan. So what we have just done in our misapplying of time, 
we have attributed the characteristics of the devil. We have now placed them upon God. That's what we've done. And when you do that, you're in the process of committing the unpardonable sin because you're calling what is light, you're calling it darkness. And what is darkness, you're calling it light. Does that make any difference? You bet it does. You bet it does. <clears throat> Can't God make up his mind? In five chapters, it goes from prophetic time to literal time? Come on, God. What a horrible, horrible picture we're painting of the God of heaven. What was true in Daniel 7 is true in Daniel 12. It was prophetic time in Daniel 7. It's prophetic time in Daniel chapter 12. From the time that the daily sacrifice, the daily shall be taken away and the abomination to make a desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,335 days. Both of these time periods prophetic time. Both begin at the same time. Both begin in 508 AD. It was the work of Clovis, a Catholic king of France in 508. It was some battles that he won in 508 AD that paved the way for the setting up of the abomination that maketh desolate. And it's from that date of 508 that these two time periods begin. The 1290 years end in 1798. The 1335 days or years end in 1843. Again, anybody interested, I have a PowerPoint program on that. You could go back and study it for yourself. This, folk is where the great confusion lies amongst us as a people today. Because we want to reapply time and make it a day for a day. This is a day for a year. God is consistent. God is trustworthy. God doesn't change. God is worth trusting. Mm -hmm. Daniel 12, 7 repeats Daniel 7, 25. It's the same time period as Revelation 12, 14. They're all applied as a day equals a year. Some today want us to apply Daniel 12, 7 as a day equals a day. To do this immediately creates confusion and demands the answer to a most serious question. Can't God make up his mind? Does, does God change his mind so quickly? In Daniel 7, 25, we say it's prophetic time. Daniel 12, we say it's literal. Is God that fickle? The time period either represents 1,260 years or it represents 1,260 days right across the board. We must be consistent. If we apply it as literal in one place, we must apply it as such in every other place. I will never forget the man that taught me the Bible when I was in junior college back in 1977. Friends, if he had done, when he went through Daniel 7 and he showed that the time times and half a time were 1260 years from 538 to 1798, I was so excited to see the fulfillment of Bible prophecy in time in history, right from Scripture. If he had then gone and said, but Bill, five chapters later, God changed his mind. Now it's literal time. You know what I would have done? I would have closed my Bible and said, thank you, Pastor, have a great day. And I would have never studied with him again. Never studied with him again. Because that would have been completely illogical. Completely illogical. Bible says, Malachi 3, 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed, 
Psalm 119, 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus doesn't change. Doesn't change. If we hear people trying to make Christ change in anything that's in the Bible, whether it be on time prophecy, or on health laws, or on the Sabbath, friend, we must oppose the, that person graciously, but firmly. We must oppose them and reject what they're saying. Otherwise, we're in danger of following them down a path to gross darkness. What is the God of heaven? <coughs> Changeable? One of the note in closing. When in Korea, after we read those few simple statements from the Spirit of Prophecy that there was no prophetic time after 1844, the man then proceeded to get up in the following meeting and he declared that there were other statements from Ellen White where she clearly showed that there was time in the future. Well, folk, what the person did was is they misapplied the statements from the Spirit of Prophecy. And in so doing, they made Ellen White have a waxed nose. Now, what I mean by that is simply this. If you read a simple statement from the Spirit of Prophecy that cannot be controverted, and then somebody comes over and says, oh yeah, but over here she says something that completely contradicts it. What you need to do is say, show me that statement. I want to read it for myself in context. Because folk, Ellen White, like the God who inspired her, does not change. Right. She doesn't change. So if you hear somebody trying to make her fickle, to make her change, or as it were, to make her go this way or this way, whatever way you want, you know you're listening to somebody that's not being honest with you. Amen. Be very careful. We're in a war. We're in a war. We need to have our battle.